the signs. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal. We are, as always, streaming live from Key West, Florida. Today is a great episode. I have Adrian Miller with us. Adrian, it is so good to have you. Welcome to Fire Builders Live. Hi, thank you. So great to be here. I wish I was really there, but I'll I'll deal with being here. It's funny because we were just talking about that right before the live, right? Uh, and I wish you were here too. In fact, you were the last person that I had a margarita with at Schooner Wharf Bar. Excuse me. Do you have? <laughs> you were and my for... last hug. You were my last non-family hug. I That's... have this picture up there to remind me. That's right. That's right. For those at home uh, that are listening, what? Adrian's holding up is this business card and I have, I can take a photo on my phone and put it, I used to carry around this tiny little printer and I would print out these business card sized photos and stick them to the back of my business card. And that was the last picture that we took together back in March. I have it on the shelf above my desk and I was talking about it this morning because one of the questions I asked on a call was, who is the last non-family hug? that you had and most people couldn't remember. I felt that I, they were like, I said, I remember immediately. I remember right. it was the day before I went back to New York and we shut down. That's it, right. It, man. That's right. That's right, man. That was a, that was a great time. And so let's, so we will get into that, but first, <laughs> before we do, let me explain to those listening at home, what, in the world we do with this show fire builders live we stream live monday through saturday every day at noon eastern and we bring on experts like adrian we take these big goals these big topics and break them down into small steps things that you can do every day to consistently improve because that is the name of the game consistency and today we are talking about sales we are talking about i mean honestly i can't think of a better person to talk to about sales than adrian in the description, and you know, I didn't clear this with you at first. I, I sent this to you last night, but you know, I compare you to Alec Baldwin's uh, character, the always be closing character, because you, you know, you're so sweet, and you know, you have your scarf, and you look so nice. But then, when you get into sales mode, you're just like, whoosh, you know, you tell the truth, and so that is why I, I'm so looking forward to our conversation. You're a sales trainer, consultant, speaker, author, right? You basically sit down with people, you look them in the eye and you tell them the truth and you do it with almost a brutal compassion, but it's something that I love about you. Uh, you have a consulting business called Adrian Miller Sales Training. You've worked with all kinds of clients, large and small, helping them squeeze every cent out of their sales and marketing pursuits. And you are also, you've authored so many books. You've got The Blatant Truth, 50 ways to sales success the blatant truth how not to screw up the customer service game we were just talking about you're almost like a writing machine you just wrote four blog posts by 6 30 this morning right so honestly adrian i know you're so busy and i'm i'm so honored to have you thank you and welcome again to fire builders live thank you i'm i'm telling you brutal compassion okay i'll i'll give you the credit but i will be using that I really <laughs> like that and I love it you know when I go in there and it's like so you know I'm I'm sitting down right now I'm a small person and I think I can actually get away with some of the things I say and maybe some of the way I say it in that I really am I'm a small very non-threatening person and um, I think it might be different if I was some, um, this sounds very sexist, but some six foot seven guy or something like that. But I'm a little woman. I'm not very big. And so, yeah, I think sometimes also when I'm trying to pitch my own business in a sales situation, uh, it's like all of a sudden, oh, little person. And then I open my mouth. <laughs> right. Like, okay, sit, lean forward and listen. And you got some big ideas, exactly. Like, uh, you know, and and real quick, before we get into it, I wanna say, so Leslie, uh, Leslie Figure just commented, right? I'm not sure, but I actually got that term, brutal compassion from Leslie, from one of our conversations. I thought it was so good that I started using it. So I wanna give credit where credit is due. Okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, and by the way, if you don't know Leslie, you guys should really connect. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, so so anyway, but yeah, you know, you are like, like, like 
Sun Tzu, right? Art of war. All war is deception. I mean, honestly, you come into these places, like you say, non-threatening, but then you just wow them with a lot of your concepts, the ideas that you have. You tell people exactly what they need to do. And, um, and, and you've just got so much experience with that. The stuff that you're talking about, it's not just theory. It's like empirically proven. You know, one of my first jobs, I was um, working and my um, direct report, who I used to go out with and do sales presentations, was this six foot four guy. And um, for those of you who don't know, I barely clear five two. And he also was a trained actor. So he had this amazing voice and this amazing presence. And I realized, man, I just had a, I had to get into this game. I really did because yeah. otherwise I was just going to be sitting at the table, one of those people silent the whole time. That's just not my style. And I said, "All right, I'm going to I'm going to have to be me. I'm just going to have to be me." And this is me. I am a very um no BS, tell it like as it is. I really am compassionate and I love you dearly. And I, everything I say is because I would like to help when I don't want to help, when I think you basically, pardon the expression, suck, I'm probably not going to say anything. I'm going to recede. I'm going to go silent, etc. But all the other time, it's, it's, the, it's the physical me shaking your shoulders to see it more clearly and to get out of your own way. We're our own worst enemies with sales. It's a very vulnerable spot to be in. You know, marketing is up here. Marketing's fun, man. Isn't it fun? It's it's writing things and it's having pretty pictures done for you or by you and it's getting a groovy website that you can click on this and this little animated shit going up and down. Sales is where you either get a yes or a no. It's it's where the revenue flows. Mm -hmm. And you feel very vulnerable. And I feel for everybody who is ultimately driving revenue into the, either their own company or the company that's hired them, because I feel like there's really, I, I wrote um, dispatches from the sales trenches at one point. I really feel like I'm in that, or I, I wrote dispatches from the front line. I, I had that vision in my head when I was writing it. You yeah. Know, I, I have the, my whole uh, army corps behind me as I go in to get this business. So, yeah. Well, you know, and you're right. I'm one thing that you just said that I wanted to ask you about is is the difference between like wanting and not wanting to help. And I I ask you actually maybe to go a little bit deeper into that. What is it about people? Because you're so compassionate and you're so energetic when it comes to helping. But what is it that get you to not want to help someone? Like, what is it that you see? Is it that they don't want to help themselves? No, it go, no, because there's a lot of people who don't want to help themselves. And it takes me a long time, a long time to kind of throw up my hands. It really does. I, I'm either a glutton for punishment or, or um, you know, I, I, I just keep pushing through. That's my way I do life. I just keep pushing through. Um, no, there's a certain sourness to some people that that oozes out of their being. It really, in everything they do, in how they approach humans, in how they approach life, it's always bad. There's always a negative. And I could be as sarcastic and snarky as anyone, but, but it is always done with affection and love. And I also know when to shut it off. And obviously it's the wrong place to be that. It's the person who, it, it may even be the right place for snarkiness or sarcasm, but it's ugly. Everything about it is ugly. Mm -hmm. And um, and I can't, I, you know, and I, and I in my non-medical way, think there's really some psychological issues at play, but I'm not a shrink. And I don't pretend to be. I don't play one. And um, I'm not even interested in the reasons. You know, someone I was talking about someone this morning uh, who I feel oozes a lot of ugliness. And they said, they're so sad. Maybe something. And I said, I get it. But I don't want to deal with it. There's a lot of sad stories. And there's a lot of bad. 
And there's lots of people who overcome it. And then there's others who let it define them. I don't want it to define, I, I can't deal with it. I'm not good at it. I'm, I'm really, I'm a little too pushy for that. So um, no, I can, I can get in there and, and, and stay in the muck with you for a while, but yeah. then after that I've got to climb out and move on. So. Yeah. It will just shows, I mean, in that description, it just shows how important it really is to anything that you do, but sales marketing, especially because it's so based and rooted in human connection that the first order of business is just to be the best person that you can be, to not ooze that sadness. Like forget, forget the tactics and stuff, right? Forget like all of the sales strategies and everything. Just be a fucking good person. Yeah, there's that cliche, people buy from people they like, right? Um, and, you know, we've all bought things from people we didn't like too, but as an overall rule, um, you want to be a likable. Well, what is for sales? You just want to be a likable person. I mean, you just want, it's easier to go through our life being a likable person. You want to be the kind of person that people will go to help, will lean in towards you, will, you know, will drop something and say, how can I help out? That kind of stuff. And you don't have to go that far to get people to feel that way about you. Mm -hmm. There's a word that we have seen one too many times. There's a few words out there now that I think we've seen one too many times, particularly in this COVID era. Um, the new normal is a phrase I want to shoot myself if I say it again, but um, it's authentic. And, and that word existed before now, but we seem to see it a lot now. But it really is meaningful in, in this day and age when there's a lot of... Um, uh, charades out there and, and, and postures that can be pinned immediately. I think when people aren't authentic, I, I don't, I wonder if they don't realize that we can see through that. Yeah. You know, are we stupid? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's resonating right there for us to see. So I hope I'm authentic. I am who I am. I always tell people I, I'm not really smart enough to be anything other than me. I, I, people say, oh, I really love the way you write. Well, good, because that is how I can write. I write for a living and I write content for people. But man, if you don't like my style, I can't, I can't massage it too much. So I tend to write for people who, who really like it. And I could, you know, I modify it a little bit. But um, I, I can't sound all that different. And I think really good ghostwriters can. I'm not a ghostwriter for that yeah. reason. I sound like a lot of people. Almost like method actors, right? Like uh, where they just dive in deep into the psyche of someone and can adopt that as their own personality. But it's, if, if you're really doing this and you are, you know, you're so you're comfortable and you're proficient at writing just in your own style, why would you want to do anything else? Especially if you've got a good message to say that the world needs to hear and you're and you're profiting from it in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, that's that was a second. That was a second business, maybe. I don't know if it was the second or third. There's four, um, because I was writing a lot for myself, and then someone said to me, "Oh man, I just think your you know your blog's great, or your LinkedIn's great. I forgot what it was. Can you do that for me?" And I went, "No." And then I got asked that question a few times, and then I said, "Why am I turning down business? This doesn't make any sense at all." Yep. So I said, sure, I can do it. <laughs> and then you do it. <laughs> and I would yeah. make it. And, so it and, and I would imagine that the type of people, like the type of client that you would take on, really does have to be a certain type of person, right? Because, because you are writing how you're writing. And if that doesn't vibe with their customers and stuff, then it's just kind of not a good match. Abs absolutely. But it's interesting. I have been able to modify this. I wrote for a law firm. Um, because the problem with a lot of law firm writing is they are writing only for other lawyers. And so it's not anything that if you're a lay person, you really even understand. And so when you're writing for other lawyers, you're losing the me who might be a client. Let's say I'm looking to finally do a will and like I, I'm Googling it, you know, like I'm writing a will and your firm comes up and I click on it. I'm all sorts of excited because I finally made that step to admitting that someday I might not be alive. Um, and I see a site and I don't understand what they're saying. There's all these, there's all these legal terms 
instead of saying, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad you stopped here because yes, we are all going to die. So let's make sure we got our shit in order. Not quite like that, but you understand what I mean. Sure. Many law firm sites are written, and I get it. You want to have other professionals refer you, and if they look on your site and they go, "Oh, this person is they a lightweight," you should actually have a have um, like get an A plus grade for having a site that other people understand. And oh yeah, a separate section for professionals or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. No, that's actually a really good idea to have a tab that says like the professional lingo and speak and then for the lay person that's not a lawyer or not a doctor everyone who's not a lawyer most of the time do you ever get a contract and and re actually read it i have and midway through i'm going whoa i'm not i've had friends who are lawyers look at my contracts because i don't really know what i'm signing and i'm not stupid and i certainly can read but midway through i'm sure i'm missing something that can get me in trouble Mm -hmm. so I go to a friend who's a lawyer and go, either charge me for this or we'll trade something or do something, but just tell me I can sign this and not be liable for something. Right. And, they, and they go, yeah, this was pretty straightforward. I go, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> you law school for three years. Ex exactly. And, you know, it's funny because I was having a conversation with a, a guy, Mike Roderick, and he brought up a really good point that I never forgot. Um, it was that lawyers like that, doctors, Etc. When they go through the education system, they are rewarded by making their sentences as jam-packed with with five dollar words as possible, right? To be as efficient as possible with their like. I don't know about you, but if you ever tried to read an engineering like a or a physics thesis, <laughs> right? It's it's insanity. And but that is what the system rewards. The better that you can do that, the more people like cheer you on. And and what's tough in a transition, because when those people go to then maybe sell a product or service to people that are not physicists, to people that are not doctors, not lawyers, et cetera, right? They don't know what to do because they immediately default to all of that really articulate and, and complicated language. And that's like the exact opposite of what you want to do to sell or market your thing. It's the opposite of what you want to do to communicate. You, you know, it's it's sort of I went to I went to the doctor with someone because they needed to have, you know, when you're going to a doctor, sometimes if you are hearing certain things, you get very nervous and you, you, your brain shuts down. So they needed me there to kind of help them through that. They weren't sure what they were going to hear, but they wanted to have someone who had ears to listen and mm -hmm. was not as emotionally invested. And I actually stop the doctor. I went like this and he like looked at me in shock and I said, two things. You're talking way too fast. And I talk fast. So I talk fast. I'm from New York. Please do not even begin to go there. I said, and really, you may not know this, but I'm very smart. I have advanced degrees too, but I didn't go to medical school. That's the I could have gone to medical school if I chose to study biology, etc. I didn't choose to do that for my livelihood. You did. Good for you. That's awesome. Now, what you need to do is take all that incredible medical training you got and tell us what you know in language we understand, we who did not go to medical school. And he was like, <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> and my other favorite thing was when we walked into the office, they went, hi, I'm Dr. Oh, hi, Adrian. I'm Dr. So-and-so. And his name was David. And I said, hi, David. I'm Adrian. <laughs> let's, let's, you know, let's do this and try to get on the same playing field here and yep. have a conversation, not try to, not try to do that. You know, I think that that's more old school now. I'm thinking doctors don't do that. But in terms of the ability to do, I use I use the phrase real speak. I use that a, a lot. And um, real speak is the way real people have a conversation, have a communication, form that bond. And um, chances are real speak doesn't happen um, when you're spouting $5 words that are, that are almost jargon, that are only understood in its essence in your industry or profession. Mm -hmm. 
So God knows you couldn't sell that way. No, so. no way. I mean, and, and we yeah. were talking, I mean, we were talking about the, the differences. Like, is there, is there something that people need to change now recently because of COVID and everybody's talking about pivoting and, and, and all of these, all of these adjustments that they need to make. But, but we were talking yesterday for those that are listening and Adrian and I had this phone call yesterday and, uh, and we were talking about how the majority of sales strategy and the, the thought process is actually, it hasn't changed at all. It's the, the foundations are solid and they will be, they will be forever. And, and so that like easy speak that you're talking about, is that one of those sort of facets of a, a strong foundation? Um, so it's real speak, although it could be easy speak too. I like that. But real speak. Yep. Real speak. Um, so, and pivot is one of those words that became really popular the, in this uh, COVID era, past five months. I've heard and used the word pivot more times than I have ever used in my entire life. Um, and so it's, there's certain words I'm parking on the side. I don't actually want to be using them so much. So, you know, I've written, um, I wrote a blog post and I uh, thank you, Lynn Manuel, Miranda, and Hamilton. But it was sales is sales is sales is sales is sales. As take off from his love is love is love is love when he got the Tony. Um, sales is based on core fundamentals that have to be deployed exquisitely. COVID era, non COVID era, it does not matter. And, um, and ex excellent salespeople just deploy those fundamentals better than anyone else. So if you watch a hockey player, okay, my kids played hockey, play hockey. So when they were little kids, the big exciting thing was after their practice, the professional team, the Islanders came into the rink to do their practice. Oh my God, they're heroes. So of course we had to hang around and watch them. Kids were little, kids played, they were pretty good, but they were little. Everything that they did in their practice, puck shooting, positioning, all, um, speed skating, were exactly what the professionals did. They just did it better, right? They just did it better. You practice to get to be better. When you start skipping some of the fundamentals, you can't get better and you can't even stay good. It's the shortcuts that you take that keep you away from putting in the foundation. You can't build a building without a foundation. You pull away that foundation, your building will crumble. There's no question about it. So COVID, yeah, we, especially at the beginning, we're, we're like, in, we're in it now. This is our life. This is it. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know when we go out without a mask and when we can actually stop talking about the curve and, and, and we, you know, all the herd uh, tracking and all that. I feel like I'm a farmer now, but um, the we're in it. There was at the beginning, there was this, you know, every conversation was, how are you? How are you, Josh? Are you healthy? How's your family? And we asked that with like intensity. I still care about you. I still care that you're okay, but you are there. You're okay, man. I certainly care about your family, but we don't have to lay the groundwork on like fear. Cause we were, it, it seemed like pervade every conversation. And I, I think we're, it sucks. We get, we admit it, but we're I, hopefully we're a little less fearful cause we actually know the beast now a little mm -hmm. bit more than we did before. Okay. We know it. We, we, we should be scared, but we know we should be scared. And so you're taking precautions, hopefully. Um, in sales, so in sales back then, there was a lot of this, and there was a lot of no one's spending any money. No one's ever going to spend any money again, um, et cetera, et cetera. But that was bullshit even then, because even then, people were spending money, and some people, oodles of money. They were spending oodles of money. You don't think that the big companies who decided that they can no longer have that big event for 5,000 people that they were going to spend $100,000 on or more, all of a sudden pulled the plug and they were trying the free version of Zoom. Right. <laughs> we got to do our whole event in 40 minutes. You know, give me a break. They were hiring Zoom MCs and bringing in technology and getting producers and 
and everything else. And if you were smart, you figured out how to ride, ride that wave. Whatever your business is, you have to figure out who has the wherewithal to spend the money and how can you position yourself as essential, essential. I mean, we positioned essential workers. We now use that term. I never used those, those combination of words in my life until now, essential worker. There are lawn signs, right, that say thank you essential workers. And they have everyone from the doctor to the Uber driver to the person who's in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. um, I get it. So how do you think about your business? Why? How can it equate? This was always the truth. How can it equate to an improvement in somebody's business or personal life? If you can nail that, you should be able to sell it. If what you do doesn't equal any improvement, well, why would I do anything with you exactly? I mean, what's the point? Um, the cliche, the devil I know is better than the devil I don't, don't fix what isn't broken, all those things come out in spades. And even more so when people do feel a little vulnerable. But if you can figure out, and you should have figured it out before COVID, why what you do equals an improvement, then, then you're awesome. Then you should be able to present what you're doing. You don't have to cut your rates. You don't have to give it away. You can just continue to sell. It's always been about presenting improvement and appealing to what people want not need so much, needs there, but want is so much bigger, so much better. I don't ever need another pocketbook, okay? I never need another pocketbook, especially if I stay in the house any longer, <laughs> pocketbook again. No, I'll never need another pocketbook, not because I'm a pocketbook um, hoarder, but because they don't wear out, they're leather. They're like, they're like heavy leather. And, and, and what do you do with your pocketbook? It's not like you're, you're, you're doing, it's not like you know, running, uh, running it over by a car or something. You're carrying it over your shoulder and then you put it down on a table. Then you pick it up, <laughs> you carry it on your shoulder till you go to your next meeting and you put it down on the table and it holds your Metro card and your wallet and your eyeglasses. So I have a, some pocketbooks. Now I don't, ever need another pocketbook. But I can tell you, I'm sure in the rest of my life, I will want another pocketbook and I will buy another pocketbook. So want is definitely Trump need in that regard. You do, know? You, do you feel, I've heard some people talk about the, you know, that difference between wanting and needing and the fact that you, can, you can't really, as someone that is selling a product or service, you can't actually really create that want within someone. All you can do is look inside of them as best you can and discover the wants that already exist and then link your thing to those in some clear totally. way. Totally, because some of the benefits and improvements that we we lean on when we're selling, I mean, they're all the ones you know about, right? Oh, so what I do helps you save time or, or save money or make money, but a huge driver a huge driver for a lot of products and services is status. Okay, well, I, I was gonna point to my watch. I don't wear a watch anymore either. I used to wear a watch. There's a lot of things that have gone away now that I'm, right. <laughs> I'm sitting in this chair all the time. Um, so I have a regular watch. I don't even remember what brand it is, but it lets uh, um, Fossil, uh, Swatch, one of those kinds of watches, kind of like a disposable watch. You buy it yep. more kind of cute and have like an orange band and okay, it's a watch. It's not a um, it's not a solid gold Rolex that costs as much as my car. All right, some people, a lot of people, have those watches. Are we are we actually selling a Rolex because it tells good time? Well, damn it, my Swatch sells good time too. Of course not. It's status, man. Solid gold Rolex. A person who's wearing the solid gold gold Rolex usually has their sleeve just appropriate. <laughs> right in the perfect amount to see that the, the glimmer of light off of that face. Yeah, it's a status buy. It's a status buy. Oh, it's an investment. All those things. So you 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 figure out what are these key improvements and benefits. They're, they always circle around time, money, convenience. Oh, it's a huge thing. Also, peace of mind and convenience. You could sell a lot of things for triple the 
price if it really you can communicate the peace of mind that it gives to you mm -hmm. um, status health these are core things they did not change so much in this era but clearly some things sort of bubble to the top health peace of mind and health so i'll tell you what i bought i don't even know what it's called it was at the beginning of this whole era you put it on your finger. Oh, blood. Um, like oxygen. Like oxygen level. Level. Yes, yes. An oximeter. Yep, yep. I didn't know what an oximeter was, but I knew on Amazon I could get one for $99. And I did. It was on back order. I just hoped I didn't die before then, but I bought <laughs> it. It's, um, it's in my um, linen closet, uh, still in the box. Okay, I'm thinking maybe sometime I can return it. I never opened it. I saw, oh, I bought it. Um, health and peace of mind that should I, God forbid, get this beast of a virus, that I would be able to keep on top of it and how sick I was and maybe what I had to do with this little device. <laughs> so that was definitely, um, I think that was definitely a want and a need, but it was, and it was definitely, um, it, and I, I didn't, I didn't look at money, a price. I just was, I was, go, I go through, I'm a, I'm a fast Amazon shopper. I don't sure. look at everything. Well, click that's in the cart done by now. Um, but it was, um, it was such an interesting kind of purchase for me. Cause I don't usually purchase on those platforms of health. That's not my thing so much. You know, I know what I buy health and uh, health and, and convenience for that one and peace so of so mind. It sounds, it sounds to me like, like, a, like a, a little bit, a little bit like, like everybody's, everybody's want wrong. is the same. It's just that might some of this might have been reshuffled, right? Some some you know the health and the and the convenience and the fact that time, right, just might be just a reshuffling of whatever that hierarchy of needs actually are. Definitely, but I'm 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 a sales trainer, so for my business and what I try to get at for other people when I'm working with them. At the end of the day, all of us need to be generating revenue. We need to have money coming in, unless you will live in an entirely different world that I'm not familiar with, and somehow you don't ever have to earn money. There are, they may not be watching your show. If they are, I'd like you to email <laughs> me, please, directly. Let's talk. But um, everyone else, I know I'm different variations of money, of how much you need or anything else, but so... You have to, whatever your product or service is, people need to want it, then translate to need it, and you have to be able to communicate to that them those issues very succinctly, but you had to do it before COVID too. You had to do it. I've, I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time. None of that changed. Except for, yes, we certainly started sales conversations and there was a lot more. And yeah, there was a little bit of conversation. Are you home? Are you staying safe? Are you quarantining in New Mexico? Where are you? The whole right. thing. But after we got past that, we moved on to what we're really talking about. And I'm kind of glad we, we have moved past that because we have to at a certain point. This is the end of five months heading into six months, half of our year, we have been doing this. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, it's time. It's time to like the small talk and everything and, and actually just move into the, the, subs, the, like, the substance of, of the conversation. And actually, it brings me to a good point because you know, one of the things that I love to ask people on this show is, is what would you distill it down to? And you've touched on this a little bit where, where if – the name of the game is really to, to make sure that you are effectively communicating what people want first, then what they need, right? And, and doing that in a way, like you said, sort of before COVID and, and now during COVID, uh, if people, I don't know, aren't necessarily used to doing that, or maybe they never thought about it in that way, how would you start to explain it? What would you suggest that they do a little bit every single day to get there? Okay, so I think they need to get there before I suggest one thing they have to do every single day. First of all, every single day, 
you have to do something that is propelling you forward with your business. My suggestion is certainly to set a block of time, it's very easy to do that, so that you don't um, BS yourself. Okay, it is, and particularly if the thing you are having to do or the things you have to do are things you don't like to do, okay? Mm -hmm because then it is incredibly easy to BS yourself that you didn't have any time because you never have time for the things you don't like to do, yet the things you like to do, you find innumerable hours to do them. Most people these days have defaulted entirely to digital. They email everybody, they communicate on social media, they have, um, forgotten that one-to-one -one communication actually by voice on a phone call is hugely powerful and it will do more to propel your proposal, your, your pitch, your sales proposition or anything else forward than all of the friggin' emails in the world, particularly the ones that say, Hey Josh, just checking in. <laughs> Wonder if you've had time to look at my proposal. I mean, really, how many of my just checking in emails? You like me. If I sent you, hey, just checking in more than a couple of times, I think you'd probably delete me too because you're too busy. Checking in, touching base are the two of the most heinous phrases you can be using in a sales situation because they're cliche. You only check in and touch base with aged relatives that you're not quite sure what else you're going to say to them. So you're checking in to make sure they're still alive and they know you're there and care about them and moving on. So I always say one thing you should be doing is setting, setting your goal. Is it five people? Is it 10 people? Is it existing clients? Are they prospects? Are they networking resources? Are there people you're trying to reconnect with from your far distance past and you're bringing them forward and pick up the freaking phone and make some phone calls. Okay. And add value to the relationship, add value to the relationship. Um, it, it, just your voice, just your, hey, how you doing, is not adding value to the relationship. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, it, it, seems like, it seems like thinking about that in advance, who that person is, like having a game plan before you go in is the way to go. Totally. So I, I train this all the time. It's like, and I can't say it enough. And if people are listening and have heard me say it, you, you will hear me say it. It'll be my last dying breath because no one does it enough. Introductions, invitations, and information. The three eyes. So invitations. If I send you an email or make a phone call and I'm introducing you to the next, your next client, your next coolest person you're going to ever meet and you're going to like be sending me roses because I made that introduction, you will never turn away my vo voicemail. You'll always return it, my phone call or my email. So introductions. You should be able to put people together. It is not that difficult put people together because they have business synergies, put people together because they both like to collect wine, put people together because they both like to ride their motorcycles, put people together because they work with the same type of market, but they don't do the same business. Whoa, well, there's an idea. Put people together. Um, invitations, well, shit, man, aren't you getting a ton of invitations to Zoom this, Zoom that, webinar this, webinar that, blah, blah, blah. Now. Just set, press forward. Why would you like, you don't even have to copy and paste, just press forward with a little line that says, hey, this is probably gonna be very cool. I'm not sure I can eat, attend, but I wanted to make sure you know about it. Mm -hmm. Great way to stay in contact. And then information. I mean, um, I, 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 Google is my research assistant. I've used that line a lot. I, I mean, I use Google for everything and I feel like there are times when I can go to page seven where no one goes and find a little nugget that I just know you would love to know or it's about your competitor or something else and I'll just copy and paste it or I'll send a TED talk that you know completely blew me away. So if I send somebody one of those three things I can reconnect, I can stay visible, I'm not checking in and touching base. I mean, it's different. We're not talking about calling real good friends or people that it's, you know, it's, it's an ongoing everyday thing. But we're talking about that, that business development slog that we have to go through where your cycle, your cycle be, can be months, if not years. Yeah. 
And people forget about you. People don't go to bed at night with um, a post-it like this under their pillow. And it says, Adrian. <laughs> so the first thing they see in the morning is Adrian's name. That's never happened. So we need to make sure that we're front and center in a meaningful way, adding value every step of the way. And eventually, hopefully, if we've gotten to the nugget of need and want, and we've planted all the seeds, and we've asked the right questions, and we've overcome objections, we should get some business. Well, what is for you personally, and in your experience, what's the longest that you go staying out of touch? Like, do you maybe every couple of months? Um, what is it for you? Well, for me, it, it depends on um, what priority level that person is. That sounds very cold and healthy. <laughs> but I'm a friendly girl, you know? Sorry, you're priority three. So it's uh, <laughs> six months at the least. Yeah, right, and you're four. Well, I'll talk to you in two <laughs> No, it's really, you look at people, um, the cold and calculating now, what's their, um, the potential sales worthiness? I mean, is this, is this going to buy you a loaf of bread or is this going to buy you a new house? Short term sales worthiness and long term. I don't mean to be disparaging of somebody that starts with a little bitty project because you know there's, there's huge potential. So I look at potential sales worthiness. Um, I look at the percentage likelihood I'm going to be able to pull through this piece of business. And I'm brutally honest with myself too. And like, you know, I have the, who are you kidding, Adrian pile? And right. then, you have, well, you can like, you could probably bank on this one, you know, do, do you judge, do you judge that based on just your experience in the past? And then um, I, I'll certainly use experience and just like, I, I believe that there really is something called, a, a, if you know yourself, but a, a gut feeling. I have good gut instincts. And mm -hmm. I guess I was born out of a lot of experience, but I do have, I mean, in a lot of things, I have good gut instincts. But no, I mean, I, I'll, all of the people who are circling around in my database, I've done a certain degree of, of work and research and I've looked into their company and I, I know about the people I'm working with and I've explored them online and I've, I've read their stuff. So I know how to address them. I know they're a pragmatic person or I know they want to spend a few minutes talking about, you know, airy fairy things and I'll, I'll become whatever I have to become for that conversation. But we have a limited time every day. So the more you can screen and qualify those people in your database, the more you're able to answer, how do you stay on the grid? And if somebody has a very high potential of closing, their sales worthiness is very high, I don't want to be forgotten. And I don't want some competitor squeezing in yeah. at the last minute after I've laid all the groundwork and practically sold in the whole concept of sales training. Because remember, I could do that. You are an interest in sales training. Now I came in, I, I pitched my little heart out. I answered all your questions. I overcame your hesitancies. I showed you um, uh, cost benefit analysis. I did all that stuff. Whew. They, you love me. You think I'm great. And then I just sat back and was eating donuts and thinking you were going to call me. And while I was eating my donuts, it came a really good, and I have some really good competitors who I'm friends with because there's enough business in the world for all of us. I do not go to sleep at night worried that someone's going to win business away from me. There is enough out there. That's a horrible way to live your life. I believe in um, inclusiveness, not exclusiveness, because there's enough around for all. And so, but you you came in and they like, all, and you, you I've already sold that you on the whole idea of sales training. You, you, I did three quarters of the work and now somehow you sucked it away. That's like annoying. <laughs> so yeah. I let that happen. Here's, here's, a, here's a line. I use it all the time. You can't lose what you don't have. You can't lose what you don't have um, unless you are a certifiable psychotic, unless you are threatening people that you know where their kid goes to kindergarten, mm -hmm. unless you are threatening and obnoxious and horrid, seriously, 
a phone, if you think a phone call or an email um, reconnecting or connecting or doing whatever it is you're doing in that is going to make someone say, heck, I'm not working with her. You, you, you're completely, we have to talk. We yeah. We have to talk. Yeah. Because that's not going to happen. You cannot lose what you don't have. You never had it. You don't have it. And don't think that because you touch them that they're going to go away. Touch point management is one of the things people need to develop a really careful formula for themselves and live it and breathe it every day. That's great. I mean, I never, never even heard of that phrase, touch point management. But now that you explain it in that way, it does make a lot of sense. Like having this internal metric on how you're going to qualify people and then, and then setting boundaries for yourself, like setting rules for how you're going to follow up and, and, and in what manner and what you're going to say, how you're going to deliver value. Like you said, uh, I think that's key. And if that is indeed what people should do on a daily basis, right? My, I love this next question because this next question really does hit it home in your experience and working with so many people in different industries. If someone just started to do this over the next month, but did it consistently, the key with there would be every single day, did it consistently, yeah. what would happen to them? What would change? Yeah, cons the word is consistently. Like anything, I love the 30 day measurement. It's like they have, you know, the, the diets for 30 days. And actually my best 30 day was the, the guy, I forgot his name, Sperling. I forgot what his first name was. The di guy who ate McDonald's, only McDonald's every day for 30 days. And what yeah. happened to his health? Whoa, that movie. If anyone's listening to that, go go get that. Take that, you know, I don't know what it's on, Hulu, Netflix, something. But find that movie and, and, and watch it. It's scary, actually. Yeah. Uh, some, if you do something consistently for 30 days, no matter what it is, Good, bad, or indifferent, something's going to happen. In this in this case, you maintain a sales pipeline, a sales funnel. I don't care what you call it, um, but if you are continually reaching out to a set number of people with value added touch points, whether it be and I, I'm a big believer in phone. I think what happens is people send forth. 30, 40, 50 emails. Sales is a contact sport. Mm. You can't really prospect by email. Um, nobody opens up a cold email by somebody they don't know. It's delete, 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 delete. Maybe if your email, you know, my subject line is, hey, Josh Capel suggested that we talk, assuming it's a real person, they're going to open it because they know you. People who use my name in a subject line, for the most part, people are going to open it. But if you are combination, I don't mean to say it can only be calls, but a combination of email and communication on social media and phone calls, doing it consistently 30 days with um, an adherence to basic sales strategies and concepts, you will wind up and you, I can't say you're going to wind up with a new client because for some, your sales cycle is so bloody long and you maybe only have a handful of clients a year. You have a very high ticket business and just a handful a year. Um, but you will see that your funnel, you've pushed some people down closer to the end where they come out as dollar signs. You will have taken some people who are who are wastes of time. They're never going to do business with you. You, you. you will find out you will have a better match with your prospects. I mean, all of this stuff about sales means prior to even thinking about it, you know who your prospects are, or you make certain that at the very beginning of this whole conversation, you've, you've done your requisite screening and qualifying. Yep. Well, you know, you have basic questions that you ask and not necessarily these words, you know, are, are you part of a decision-making team? What is the application that you be using my products and services? Are you, do you have a budget? Is this a wish list kind of thing? Because I work with a client that that was exactly the phrase, wish list. Three years down the down the pike, we're going to get funding for this, but not now. So well, that's fine. They had sales cycle that was three to five years. You just put that in. Are you looking at the competition? 
You know, have you started to investigate the competition? People say, oh, I don't want to mention the competition. What do you think? They didn't figure out that there was yeah. competition. <laughs> They it's all like, have Google just like you do, you know? Yeah, I got the same. I type in sales trainer. I figure I can get a few a few names out there and not mine. Um, so you have some questions. You screen and qualify. And if you do your outreach consistently over 30 days, one, you'll have a cleaner list. Two, you'll definitely have prospects who are further along in the sales cycle. You will have – and what's your goal? That first touch, is it is it getting another appointment um, for a phone call? Is it a presentation? Do you, do you, is it a request for a proposal? You have to know what your actual goal is in the first place. It's much more complicated than I think people must think because they're disappointed sometimes. Um, I work with one person. He was a CPA, and it doesn't come naturally necessarily for people in the accounting profession. And I can say that accounting doesn't come naturally for me, so we each have our own roles. But he was blown away that after going to a couple of networking meetings, he didn't have like a new client. He, he thought it was like a waste of time. Um, so it's all that seed planting that mm -hmm. some people are very impatient with. And unfortunately is part of the picture, unless you sell a very fast sale transactional item that people can like, put in their supply. You're always going to need copier paper, put it in the supply cabinet. There's a deal on reams of supply paper, uh, copier paper, just buy five because they're so cheap, shove it in the supply cabinet and you're done. Great sell. Very easy. People can actually knows what, know what you're talking about. They can quantify it. So, but yes, consistently for 30 days. So one thing, I tell people they should track, they should have a little check off at the end of the day. Um, did I do it or not? I'm the kind of person that if I don't do it, I can barely go to sleep and you may get a call from me at three in the morning because I can bring and make those calls. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And you see my number, you put, a, put your phone on silent. Um, but really for the rest of people who think I am a maniac, um, okay, today sucks. I, I really wanted to wear uh, fuzzy slippers all day and watch old reruns on TV or I just was sleepy or I wanted to read a book or I, I just I was so blue. I just knew I shouldn't do anything. I get it. But you, you it's whatever. Number, if you have a five day work week, a six day work week, a seven day work week, I don't care. But there the days are going to move along and you're going to have to catch up at some point. Yep. Don't yourself that slack that's where it starts to fall apart i didn't go to, i said i was going to work out an hour a day every day and i didn't do it monday or tuesday and wednesday i'm sorry you got three hours coming in babe yeah yeah exactly and you know at that point you say well is it really worth it and then you start to talk yourself out of it and exactly yep. exactly yeah because you build some momentum and the best thing that happens which will drive you for, forward is you'll you'll start to feel some success. It's like, it, I, I don't really diet, but I hear this is true. When you get on the scale and you see that you lost a couple of pounds, isn't that awesome? Does that make you want to continue? Does that make you not want to, you know, shovel in like the donut? Um, because you lost the weight. Same thing. If you get a, if you get a good response on a phone call, if you get somebody replying to an email and going, Oh my God, Adrian, thank you. I really want the appointment. That would keep me going yeah. way past my hour or two, whatever I said. Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, and most of the time when people get to whatever arbitrary goal that they have set for themselves, you know, they, they get there. And let's say that your goal in this example was to lose 25 pounds. And all of a sudden, magically, you woke up in the morning and you looked, you stepped on the scale and there, there they're gone, 25 pounds, you're lighter, right? Do you think in any way, shape or form that you would have the motivation to continue to work out in any way? Like you've hit that goal and now, now that you've hit it, you're either the type of person that says, all right, it's done and now I can relax or you set yourself a future goal of which you will then progress to. And I think that a lot of people um, just kind of just hit that goal and they say, all right, finally, like I can just kick back and, and coast for a little bit. And, uh, and that's why I think 
that you're right on about the progress because it's really the, the falling in love with the progress and not necessarily the end result that's going to get you the success that you're looking for. Really good salespeople are super competitive with themselves, with themselves. And, um, and yeah, they, they just keep doing it because they just, first of all, they set the goals high. I mean, when I work with companies, I always say set achievable goals, but you have to work for them. Reach goals. Okay. Set reach goals. Don't set goals that are so easy to get that you don't even have to work hard. It's like playing a really bad team. You're, you're like, you get, you get lazy and your skills don't really get fine tuned because you don't have to deploy any skills. So set some, some reach goals and, and then some even a little further along and keep people motivated to go further and faster and get more. And that's not saying you're not satisfied or you're, I don't mean satisfied now I'm not doing anything. You don't feel good about yourself and you don't acknowledge your success, but it you should be propelled to go forward. I'm the first to say, um, set milestones along the way, right? Set milestones along the way. So you don't have to get all the way to the end. So maybe if you lose five pounds or you get that first meeting with that big, big, big company, it's not with the decision maker, but it's with an influencer, reward yourself, whatever a reward yourself means. At this, you yep. know, I would say, let take your friends out for a drink. Well, we can't go out for a drink, you have a Zoom meeting for a drink. What if you have to go onto Amazon and buy yourself something? Uh, take the afternoon off, do whatever it is that you're, you're going, man, I did good and, and set milestone goals, but don't be so easy on yourself. That's, that's one of the issues when you're an entrepreneur, you know, we don't have necessarily people, um, pushing us and doing that. You have to do it for yourself. That's why I'm a big believer in community. Have your community, have your posse, have your informal board of advisors who will kick your ass and will not let you sit back and become a donut eating girl. Yep. Because, um, because sometimes when you work for yourself, you don't have those Drivers, yes, I know you have to pay your mortgage and pay your rent and all that stuff. But a lot of people just sort of, they, they settle in. They kind of settle into this space that they could go so much further. And that's some of the tough talk I have to do because I'm talking to people who are pretty successful and that they're like, they're, they're getting lazy. And they yeah. should get lazy because there's so much more they can do. Seriously, I have I've loved every second of this conversation, Adrian. This has been so amazing. I, I totally agree with you. I, uh, you know, I, I can't believe that it's already been almost an hour. Th I this know. has been such an awesome, that, that just means that this was such a great conversation. Time goes so fast. Tell me if people want to connect with you. I know that you've got the sales training. I know you have an amazing network of people, Adrian's network. How do people get in touch with you if they want to further the conversation, ask you a couple questions? The easiest way is to send me an email, amiller at adrianmiller.com. And I will spell Adrian because there's 15 ways to spell it. A-D-R-I-A-N, the easiest way, adrianmiller.com. I will answer any question. I will respond to all emails. I will, you know, give you information about Adrian's network, which is really, that's my, that's my tribe. That's my community. There's hundreds of people. And we kind of do have each other's back um and help each other with lots of different things so i'm happy to talk more about that i love it excellent yeah. okay adrian honestly so so good great I, this was so much fun it was it was a ton of fun i i mean i every time that we talk i learn something from you i'm just <laughs> so impressed with how you're able to articulate a lot of this stuff in such a no bs fashion it's just refreshing it's effervescent in a way so, uh, so seriously, um, and let me, uh, let me put up. So Eileen said, honestly, great community, right? Steve, Steve, actually, while you were talking about that documentary, it was, it's called Super Size, Super Size. right? And, awesome. uh, and, and he also agreed, right? Keeping connected with clients, friends, and family via phone, not digitally. That is the way to go. Leslie actually chimed in too, 
when you were talking about addressing that doctor by his, by his first name to sort of level the playing field, right? Yeah. That's, you know, that's uh, spot on. So, uh, so seriously, this was such a good conversation. If you could leave our listeners with any quick nugget of wisdom, one last thing that you want them to take away, can you think of something? Um, yeah, and it's again a cliche, but I found that sometimes cliches are cliches because they actually are important. Um, I really fall back on the thank you, Nike. Just well, I just just freaking do it. Get out of your own way. Just stop making excuses. It's not a bad day. The weather's this, the weather's that. You don't feel good. You've got something else to do. You got to call your accountant. You've got to, you know, straighten out your drawer. You really need to identify, I don't know if it's an hour, two or three, whatever it may be. You know your, um, your productivity, you know your revenue needs, and you know your database. And just sit down and just freaking do it. 30 days in a row, you will have a difference. And enjoy it, man. What is sales? Sales is exactly what I'm doing right now with Josh. Okay. That's a set. This would be a sale. Well, it's not, but this would be a sales call for me. This is the goal for me with a sales call. Okay. Mm -hmm. If this was a real sales call, I would be asking Josh all the questions. <laughs> because one of the things you do in sales is do a lot, a lot of probing. If you ask the right questions, people will tell you what they need, what they want, when they need it and want it, what they'll pay for it. What are, what are their hesitancies and frailties and all the rest of this stuff? Just come up with 10 or 15 exquisite questions and have them in your brain and pepper your conversation with them. And, and you will learn how to sell the other person. That's all. That's what, that's my, yeah, questions. I love it. <laughs> So good. And, and to practice, like just practice, practice, practice those questions. I, uh, I honestly, I, I like can't think of a better way to describe it. Adrian, this is, this has been so friggin' amazing. Again, yeah, we, we are due for another margarita sometime in Key West. Uh, mark it on the calendar. <laughs> yep. We will make it happen. But seriously, uh, this has been so good. So I just want to thank you again for your time and thanks for being here. Thank you. I loved it. Okay. Well, uh, well, guys, this is Josh and Adrian signing off another fantastic and successful episode of Fire Builders Live. Again, we stream live Monday through Saturday, 12 noon Eastern. This was episode, Adrian, you were episode 93, uh, Insanity. I, I remember when we were talking about this at the beginning, episode one. That's and, right. Uh, you were like, even before it got to be episode one, we were just talking about it and like, whoa, here you are, ma'am. That's a congratulations to you. Really. Just, a, just a testament of the consistency thing. You know, there were days, there were days where I did not feel like doing the show, like stuff was happening here. And, you know, you just, you get sick and, uh, and, and all of this stuff, people cancel. And it's like, do I try to scramble out and reschedule? Like, what do I do? And, uh, and you're right, like the consistency is what pays off. You just do it, you hold yourself accountable, and over time, you gain that momentum. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, so anyway, have a fantastic day. Thanks again for being here. Take care. All right, guys, Bye. this is Josh and Adrian signing off. Adios. Bye. <laughs>